Welcome, everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you're joining us from today. We'd love to welcome you to the 2023 National Day of Compassion. My name is Gwen Pennington, and I am a member of the Australia Compassion Council, and my fellow members and I will be leading and co-facilitating today's activities. The Australia Compassion Council oversees the work of the Charter for Compassion in Australia, and we're incredibly pleased to have you joining us for our National Day of Compassion in 2023. We also really want to acknowledge each and every one of you for all of the compassionate work you're already doing. And we also want to acknowledge you for making the time to share in this special and important conversation today. And we look forward to sharing the day with you. This is our third year in a row celebrating our National Day of Compassion. Our first year was all about deep dreaming Australia, a continent for compassion. Our second year, last year, we focused on deep listening. And this year, in our third year, we're focusing on deep wisdom. And at this point in time, I'd love to hand it to Lynn Reeder, who will share some additional context and an acknowledgement to country. Good. Thank you very much, Gwen. Yeah, and on behalf of the Australian Compassion Council, I also warmly welcome people from Australia and around the world to this, as Gwen said, the third National Day of Compassion. In this acknowledgement of country, I am on Wadarong land, and I uh, take a moment to invite you all to, cons to consider the lands that you are, the Indigenous lands on which you are, um, as we, uh, as you are situated, as we pay respects to elders past, present and emerging. Uh, in this year, with the potential for recognition of our first Australians to be included in the constitution, uh, constitution and of a voice for those policies that affect them, the Australian Compassion Council's contribution was the release of a book entitled The Why of the Voice, where we invited Australians to develop compelling statements by choosing one of the five Indigenous mindsets as outlined by Tyson Yanka Porter in his wonderful book, Sand Talk, as a respectful starting point for this project by engaging with the voice and honouring and valuing all Indigenous forms of knowing. So for this uh, well, uh, acknowledgement of country, I just read, I'll just read from one of those statements. And this one is from well-known singer-songwriter Shane Howard of Goanna fame, who chose Story Mind as his inspiration. And Shane wrote, at its heart, this is Aboriginal land. First Nations people watched ice ages come and go. Ancient song lines reenact the deep history of the oldest continuous culture and spirituality on earth, calling us to address the fundamental lie at the heart of our national story. Aboriginal philosophy and cosmology offer up uh, offer us a great gift if we but listen. When I wrote the song Solid Rock, I dreamt of a country respectful of our ancient history and honest about our modern history. I wanted to be proud of my country. Now we have the chance to be an honourable example in a confused world. Voice is the first aspect of voice treaty truth. What possible good could come from a no vote? So I'm now going to hand over to Terry Ayling, another member of the Australian Compassion Council, who will speak to our theme for this year, Deep Wisdom, and the shift from last year's theme, Deep Listening. Thanks, Terry. Good morning. As Lynn has shared, we stand on the verge of another significant step towards realising the Australian Compassion Council's aspiration for deep dreaming. Australia, a continent for compassion. Our hope is the referendum will give a resounding yes from every part of the Australian community and so provide to new pathways of hope for Indigenous Australians to be heard, healed and helped to a more equitable future. With truth telling about Australia's early history, essential for healing and treaty a necessary step in the ongoing empowered relationships. Deep Dreaming Australia, a Continent for Compassion is not new. We believe it is embedded in this sacred land and has been passed down in the dreaming stories, 
spirituality and culture of Indigenous Australians who have been custodians of this land for over 60,000 years. Last year, within this aspiration, our National Day focused on deep listening. Dadiri, the Indigenous concept of deep listening, describes a way of learning, working and togetherness that is informed by the concepts of community and reciprocity. Leadership underpinned by deep listening involves listening respectfully, which can help build community. It draws on every sense and every part of our being. Our live event with a global audience featured speakers, including our Australian Compassion Council Ambassador, Hugh Mackay, Director, Initiatives of Change Australia, Margaret Hepworth, and international speaker, Dr. Rick Hansen, a psychologist, New York Times bestseller, and founder of the Global Compassion Coalition. Our full day program included over 30 interviews with global, national, and local thought leaders, academics, spiritual, cultural, and corporate leaders who presented insights on deep listening and how to apply these in compassionate action. We shared practical skills for deep listening to ourselves, to others, to creation, and the space in which presence and mystery reside, of how we can listen beside the words, between the words, beneath the words, and beyond the words. We heard how deep listening can create an understanding of our common humanity, evoke our compassionate action, and how to exercise this compassion with wisdom. And so deep wisdom, this year's National Day theme seemed an appropriate next step and segue in this journey. A journey Sue and Mark will invite you to share with us throughout the day in what will be another rich and stimulating program. We look forward to having you join us in our aspiration and action towards a more compassionate and wiser Australia and planet in the year ahead. Good, thank you, Terry, thank you. Uh, the overall, uh, so now I'm going to go through uh, our, again, the aspect of deep dreaming um, as to set a context. So the overall aim of the Charter for Compassion Australia is to deep dream Australia, a continent for compassion. And from its very beginning, we always sought to honour our Indigenous brothers and sisters. And we have done that not by strategizing or planning, but by deep dreaming from at least 60,000 years ago to illuminate how we Australians can better look after each other. A continent for compassion couldn't be dreamed into being without the essential inclusion of Indigenous Australians and highlighting their work. And much of our work is guided by the creative Indigenous mindsets um, as, our, as articulated by Tyson Yanker Porter, um, and those mindsets include kinship mind, story mind, dreaming mind, ancestor mind, and pattern mind, which, as I mentioned before, form the basis of our Why of the Voice project. This National Day invites all Australians to take time to pause and reflect. And so, therefore, it's very fitting to have as our first keynote speaker, Tanya Rossi, who is the great granddaughter of Auntie Marg Tucker, who with William Cooper set up the Victorian Aboriginal Advancement League well over 80 years ago. So thanks, Tanya. Thank you. Um, I think I'm here to speak a little bit of my nan and her story. Um, I'm not quite sure. I feel a little bit intimidated, to be honest, with all of you wonderful people here and all of your degrees and that I feel like I, I don't know why kind of I'm sitting here but I am the voice for my great-grandmother and I'm the voice for my grandmother and my mother before me and their stories and that's what I do in my everyday job is cultural awareness training and um, I incorporate my great-grandmother's story you know she was a um, she she was a uh, a force to be reckoned with, but with such gentleness around her from what I've been told. I'm, I remember her as a child and um, she was uh, 13 when she was removed from school and taken from her mother and put into a girls' domestic training home um, where she was for about six months and then she was sent to Sydney to a middle-class uh, white home to to help raise children and, and maintain a farm her treatment wasn't always great but 
what in enthralls me with my with my nan um is that it doesn't matter how horrific her story was she was just so compassionate with those around her and so empathetic with those around her and she she had room for everybody and you know when I when I do my cultural awareness training and I, and I talk about her on a daily basis I I think about where that comes from and and how she maintained this this um I don't know what it is, this strength to be able to not be so angry or to not be upset at the injustices of what happened to her and her people. But, you know, one thing she always said is is that, you know, uh, people only know what they know and it's not their fault sometimes when they do bad actions or bad, have bad behaviour. Um, sometimes they, they you know, um, do it because they think it's the right thing to do and there's always a lesson to be learnt in, in these things. So, you know, um, she was a very big Christian woman as well because when we our people were removed, um, all of their identity was stripped from them and they weren't allowed to practice their culture or, or be who they wanted to be. Um, so they were they were put into the these missions and and they were transformed over to um the like like the the Bible system and the 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 Catholic system. And it was something that our people, as much as um, some of them like to to debate today that that wasn't our um, sort of, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, it wasn't our creation story. I believe it plays a massive role in a lot of our older people and those people that have been removed because they needed something to believe in and they gravitated and they grabbed that. So it's become a really um, significant part of our people's lives. And yes, as much as we know our creation stories and we've got some of them back and we're learning them, um, I believe my nan had this belief system and she had this hope and she believed that there was going to be a better world one day and, you know, that, that she played her part in whatever little part she could do um, for her people, but not only her people. She, My nan played a role in, in all walks of life. You know, she used to say to us when we were little, um, it doesn't matter if you're black, white or brindle, people are people and, and we need to respect that and we need to understand that. And um, so she did a lot of work around not just Indigenous Australians, but she did a lot of work around all people. Um, and I remember when I was little, I used to say, if I could be like anyone, I want to be like my Nantucker. Um, big, big shoes to fill. Um, I don't even think I'm a quarter of a way there, but um, I do it in a different perspective um, than my Nan. She was um, she was one to be, like I said, she was one to, to look up to absolutely. And, and when I speak to people in community and of all walks of life and people of all ages, you mention Annie Marge Tucker and everybody seems to know her. Um, so yeah, my nan was a, was a, was a big light for us and a big inspiration in our family. And, you know, um, through her endurance and, and through her positivity, it has um, been passed down through our lineage. Um, it's it's just been handed down, handed down. And I always, my, my children always say to me, even though they never met her, my son always says, or, or my kids always say, you know, even though we never met Nantucka, we kind of feel like we know her. She's part of our, our world. Um, and that's because she is. And, you know, I'm a very spiritual person. And every time I get stuck or I hit a, a, a brick wall or I just have to look over to my shoulder there where you can see she's sitting over there with my nan and my mum and I, I just have to just ask what is it that I need to do. And, you know, I'll, I'll often have a dream and she'll just pop her face in there or my mum will and then I know it's going to be okay and there's there's a reason for me doing what it is that I do um, and it's sharing with with people on a daily basis, you know, our stories, um, what our people's stories, and I'm still continuing to be the voice uh, for my nan and my grandmother and my mother and for the many women and the many um, children before me that um, our history is, is um, has like... Um, what it's done to our people, but the the resilience of our people is is something that keeps me going and with what I do on a daily basis. So um, my nan was invited like 
Lynn said, um, with Uncle William Cooper, she was the first woman to sit on that board and help create the Advancement League as well. Um, she's the first actual Aboriginal woman to do lots of things. I, I don't have enough time in the day to tell you everything she's done, but um, she was the, the the first Aboriginal woman to to help with um, the Advancement League, and she has a beautiful mural on that wall now, along with a lot of our other leaders that that helped in that era. Um, and who have put a lot of spaces in place today for us. And I always say to the younger generation coming up that, you know, we don't need to create our history and we don't need to go back and fight our history. We just need to be an extension of what they've done. And that's what I try to do on a, on a daily basis is just extend what they would have done and keep purging forward and trying to do the best that um we can by telling our stories and sharing and educating. Um, people today on our, our history. I think that's it, Lynn. Good. Thank you, Tanya. That's just a beautiful story. And the stories that we need to hear that, that have been untold. And so it's so important to, to hear them. And thank you so much. That's um, it, really important to have those insights in this important year for Australia's future. So um, another amazing aspect as Tanya mentioned her great-grandmother had links to William Cooper and we're going to now hear a very short piece from the second Compassion Symphony. Uh, Lior, Nigel Westlake and Dr Lou Bennett created a new song cycle to pay tribute to Yorta Yorta elder William Cooper and his march that led a protest against Nazi Germany's treatment of Jews outside the German consulate in Collins Street in Melbourne in 1938. Amazing stories that we're just still hearing. And uh, when Lior began looking and searching for a new story to base the Compassion Symphony on, when he heard William Cooper's story, he thought this is an embodiment of so much of what the ancient texts and compassion was speaking about, extraordinary acts of courage, empathy and compassion. So we're just going to hear a short piece of that now. Like the 
Lovely. Um, at the end of this day, we're going to have a drop-in session uh, and uh, to uh, gather and reflect on the wonderful uh, sessions that we'll be having during throughout today. And we'll play the whole of that piece. It's only five minutes, but if you want to come and sit and just hear that beautiful piece in, in full, please join us again at 6 p.m. So we're now going to hear uh, from our second keynote speaker, uh, Hugh McKay, our National Charter Ambassador, author, psychologist, and well-loved Australian, who will speak with us about the deep wisdom of community. Thank you very much, Hugh. Thank you very much, Lynn, and good morning, everybody. One of the loveliest things about concepts like compassion and wisdom is that they connect us to universal themes. They connect us to the idea of the common humanity that we share with people of every colour, creed and culture. Whenever and wherever we consult ancient wisdom, deep wisdom, we find some recurring themes, the sense of our interconnectedness with all creatures and with the earth itself, the need for kindness and compassion in all our dealings, not only with people like us, uh, but with people who seem on the surface to be quite unlike us, indeed people we don't like, people we could never agree with, people who seem like total strangers to us, kindness and compassion are the currency with which we're expected to deal with all our fellow humans, all our fellow creatures. Uh, we also find a common urge across all cultures, across all wisdom, to create myths, legends, metaphors, stories that capture our deepest yearnings. We also find the need to honour our ancestors and the need to meditate upon the meaning of our own lives. And here's another point about deep wisdom. Everywhere you go in search of it, you find that it has absolutely nothing to do with the things that so often distract and preoccupy us on a daily basis. Deep wisdom, it turns out, has absolutely nothing to do with the pursuit of personal happiness or pleasure. It has nothing to do with the accumulation of wealth or power or the achievement of some status. It doesn't even have anything to do with our sense of personal identity, important though that often seems to be, whether it's based on gender or ethnicity, or cultural tastes or preferences, or religious convictions, or political views, or whatever it might be. All of that seems very important to us from time to time. And yet, in terms of deep wisdom, it, it, is, it pales into insignificance compared with the common humanity that we all share. So wherever you go, in whatever culture, Whatever historical pathway, whatever philosophical, mystical or religious tradition you consult, you're always going to find this theme as the essence of deep wisdom. Treat other people the way you would like to be treated. We sometimes call it the golden rule for very good reason. Treat other people the way you would like to be treated. How would we all like to be treated? No mystery, is there? We'd all like to be treated with respect, with kindness, with tolerance, with compassion and understanding. So if that's the essence of deep wisdom, I, I see three important dimensions uh, that flow from that. The first is that the deep wisdom points to the vital importance of our relationships, our sense of community, our sense of connectedness with each other. It's a reminder that we humans 
happen to belong to a social species. And what that means is we need each other. Our, our survival depends on our capacity to create and maintain social harmony. We need groups and communities, families, work colleagues, neighborhoods, groups and communities of all kinds to nurture us and sustain us and to give us that, that all important sense of belonging that is so fundamental to the mental and emotional health of people who belong to a social species. So deep wisdom is relational. It also points, I think, through the, that essential definition of deep wisdom, it points to the ideal of humility, the thing that Simone Weil uh, described as the queen of virtues. Because wisdom urges us to be prepared to make personal sacrifices for the common good. It urges us to be willing to apologize when we've hurt or offended someone else. Uh, to be willing to forgive people who've hurt or offended us. Uh, to set aside the ego-driven agenda that tries to convince us that it's all about me. No, it isn't. And deep wisdom calls on us to be open to each other, to listen attentively and with empathy to each other's stories, to discern each other's needs, to feel each other's pain, to share each other's joys and to learn from what we hear. That takes us back to last year's theme, doesn't it? Deep listening, because deep listening lies at the very heart of deep wisdom. It's our listening that connects us to each other. So we can't separate the messages of ancient wisdom, the deep wisdom of every culture, from that deepest truth about what it means to be human. That truth is that we are one, that we're all part of a shimmering, vibrating web of interconnectedness and interdependence, and we're at our best when we acknowledge that. Thank you, Lynn. Well, thank you, Hugh. Those are very beautiful and nurturing words for us all to take take throughout the day and uh, take with us um, along that journey. So thank you so much. Um, I'm going to now hand over to Michael Batura, uh, a fellow colleague on the Australian Compassion Council, who's going to provide a very short overview of what the Australian Compassion Council has been doing during the past year. Thanks, Michael. Thanks. <clears throat> Thanks, Lynn. Good morning, everyone. My name is Michael, and I'm honoured to share this update with you as a council member of uh, with ACC. Uh, this year is the third year we have held a National Day event, and uh, we feel it is particularly poignant to come together in exploring deep wisdom to build on the momentum from previous years. Significantly, this year in which we hope to come together, reconsider our identity and relationship with traditional owners, and courageously change for the better as a collective as we follow our journey in deep dreaming Australia, a continent of compassion. I would like now to share a series of highlights to provide you with an indication of our impact over the past 12 months under the following um, sections. Uh, last year's National Day was already described in detail by Terry. Thanks, Terry. Um, I will provide some more details on our work in the cities, our work in sectors, as well as our contribution to the work of the Global Charter. Uh, in terms of Compassionate Cities work, the City of Ballarat Youth Awards included a specific Compassion and Care Award, which was won by secondary school student Millie, who collected hundreds of care packs for at-risk families at, in the Ballarat areas. And Compassionate Gold, Gold, Gold Coast was recognized by the Baha'i community for its work in the community. As I mentioned, the Global Charter has 12 sectors, including health, education, social justice, and more. In Australia, we follow a similar structure, and now I will share with you a few examples of the activities we undertook this year. 
In 2022-23, the ACC runs several events on compassionate leadership. Council member Gwen Pennington and Mark Grosswiller facilitated an online conversation on the subject of what stops virtue, discussing the universality of the human experience as being vulnerable and how it establishes the basis of relatedness. The Ballarat CEO group continued to resource its CEOs in compassionate leadership, including with a webinar by Dr. James Kirby on, an, on his new book, Choose Compassion, Why It Matters and How It Works. In the health sector, Dr. Debbie Ling led the development of the award-winning Monash University Compassion Training for Healthcare Workers online course. This course was delivered five times in 2022, and 388 healthcare workers from around the world completed it. In the education and interface sectors, two new national coordinators were appointed. Joanna Giannis in the education center sector and Bishop Philip H H H Higgins, sorry, Philip, uh, for the interface and spirituality sector. In the peace sector, Madonna Quishley organized a lecture on Australia's role in peacemaking by Dr. John Langmore from the University of Melbourne. And we invited young refugees to read her poetry at this forum, who is daughter of Neil Para who recently walked over 1,000 kilometers um, to Prime Minister Anthony Albanese's electoral office on behalf of the 10,000 refugees living in Australia without permanent visas. After 10 years of struggle, they have finally received permanent visas. In the science and research sector, the directors of the ACC Scholars Network and the University of Sydney's Mind, Heart and Body in Business Group have organized its annual conference this one for 19 of, of October 2023. The international speaker for this conference is Professor Michael West, author of Compassionate Leadership, Sustaining Wisdom, Humanity and Presence in Health and Social Care. And finally, in terms of a contribution to the Global Charter, two members of the ACC were appointed leads for two of the Global Charter sector. Dr. Debbie Ling was appointed lead of healthcare and Dr. Lynn Reeder was appointed the lead for its science and research sector. Hopefully this quick overview of some of our activities we have undertaken gives you a sense of the breadth of work we aim to facilitate. We certainly look forward to inviting you all to further events and exciting opportunities in the coming months and into 2024. I'll now hand over to the Executive Director of the Global Charter, Marilyn Turkovich, who will invite us for to formally participate in the work of the Charter. Thank you, Michael. Um, I'm really honored to be here today and also very excited. Um, I'd like to share with you the ways that everyone can get involved with the Charter for Compassion. And as we've already spoken, we realize that we are a global community um, and that you know, oftentimes uh, the realization of that starts very much at home. Uh, we were privileged a couple years ago to have as part of one of our global gala celebrations, um, the poetry reading that came out of, um, of Australia and the involvement obviously of the Compassion Australia group with the International Charter. There are three ways that you can get involved with the charter. One is an individual. And I put this map up just because it's something that we introduced last year at the end of the year uh, in hopes of having people see one another and to share their passions with one another. And so Michael spoke about the fact that we have 12 sectors and what you have here is an indication of when people put themselves on our map of co-creators, uh, there's a color and an opportunity to let people know your interest area and how you might be able to connect immediately with one another. Uh, the other thing besides being an individual who comes to the charter um, is an opportunity if you are a partner. Uh, to of an organization, you become, uh, you know, a viable partner of what we're doing and how we're doing it, and we match it up uh, with our 12 sectors. 
And there's a wonderful way to filter that interest and to directly communicate with one another. And then the third way is to become a compassionate community. That might mean uh, not necessarily a city. Uh, in the case of Australia, we start big, we start with a continent, but then there's the opportunity to go into the city level or, um, or a regional area. But, you know, we're finding more and more that people are trying to look at compassionate communities as their neighborhoods um, and registering neighborhoods where people are coming together and talking with one another and sharing with one another. Um, and just as a final note, as you go into um, the Charter's website, you'll find lots of opportunities for engagement. In fact, in our navigation bar, we ask you or we invite you to become engaged. And so getting your name on the compassionate uh, map of co-creators, delivering a story um, that is coming out of your own community, something that's working, a great idea that people feel good about and how you might be able to share that idea so that others around the world can pick it up uh, and kind of reinvent it or take ownership of it. So those are the invitations as an individual, as an organization, and certainly as a group of people who are dedicated to trying to find solutions uh, to dialogue and work with one another in their local communities. Thank you. Well, thank you so much, Marilyn. It means a lot to us that members of the Global uh, Charter have made the effort to be here with us this morning and to share how the, the ways in which uh, the Global Charter and, the, and opera, you know, links um, across the world in, in uh, as you said, from continents to communities. And um, it's wonderful to, uh, to have you here to do that. So thank you so much. Um, and now for something special, my colleague, Dr. Sue Sumskis, is going to provide a wonderful overview of what's coming up during the rest of the day. So thanks, Sue. Thank you, Lynn. And so as mentioned before, we have sectors within uh, the Charter for Compassion. And what I'm inviting you to do now is just spend a few moments in contemplation on some wisdom that has been drawn from each of the presentations in our sectors. So I invite you to quieten your mind and just pose, pose these snippets of wisdom and these questions to yourself as we move through the presentation. Deep wisdom is a unifying consciousness that encompasses us all, one family, one world. A wise person understands that reality exists within a flow of relationships and connection, surrounded by myriad causes and conditions. Wisdom lives in this moment, right now, not in the past, nor in the future. Wisdom is our personal awareness of body and reactions and requires deep understanding of self. Wise character is built on sound habits, habits of mind, habits of body, habitualized wise behavior. Wisdom lies in seeing the pattern do the pattern so that the pattern does not do you. Ask yourself, how can I, as a self-caring citizen of this world, serve others in this moment in a way that benefits the collective? Can I sense what is being asked of me in this moment. Wisdom asks us to be open to new points of view and to see other people's perspectives. Take in 
so that you can give outwards to others. The beauty of self, the beauty of each other, consciousness and joy. Show others that there is a path to move from the dark into the light. Age and wisdom aren't necessarily related. The getting of wisdom comes from inner work. Be open and transparent about your intentions. Accept and acknowledge others' inputs and consider others' practical and spiritual wisdom. Even the smallest of us are capable of making the right decision to do kind things. When decisions come from a culture, or wise decisions, sorry, come from a culture that enable us to make change. Imagine a city flowing with lifelong learning, with health, physical, mental and environmental, and compassion. This is my dream for my city of Louisville. Wisdom takes energy. You can know that something's good and still fight against it to stay in your comfort zone. Show others the capacity to make astute, caring judgments. Think for yourself. Write it out. Draw your conclusion. Cultivate your own intuition. Pray to your personal source. Pay attention to what comes through in response. Wisdom is needed in leadership when things are changing or ought to change. Practical wisdom is witnessing the suffering of others and doing something about it. Check on yourself and be able to forgive yourself if you cross a line. How can you, as a self-caring citizen of the world, serve others in this moment in a way that benefits the collective Wisdom is a love affair with the question. And so we invite you to attend today's sessions for each sector with deep curiosity. Thank you. Well, thank you so much, Sue. That's uh, all those quotes, of course, come from every session that will be run throughout today. And wow, what a reason to attend every single one of those sessions starting with Mayor, uh, with Mayor Greg Fisher, or former Mayor Greg Fisher from Louisville to be taken through his story of how he brought compassion into his city. So, um, and I'll now hand over to uh, Dr. Mark Croswella, who will close this launch. Thanks very much, Lynn. Uh, good morning, everybody. On behalf of the Australian Compassion Council, can I thank you for joining us today? Um, we're most appreciative of your time in joining us for this most important event of world peace and compassion. Um, thank you to our presenters this morning for the valuable time and insights, particularly to Gwen, Lynn, Terry, Tanya, Lior, Hugh, Michael, Marilyn and Sue. Um, we've all benefited from your wisdom and I'm sure we have a lot to think about before we've even started the day's proceedings. Um, today gives us the opportunity to learn about and reflect upon deep wisdom and compassion from a range of different presenters, from social infrastructure, Buddhism, Indigeneity, spirituality, history, politics, transformation and futurism. Fascinating topics in rich diversity of perspective. We invite you to join all sessions if you have the time or otherwise join those sessions that resonate with you most. Um, we sent the links out um, uh, through the email system. So we'll leave today's link um, at, uh, at the conclusion of this event and then we'll click onto the new link, which will take us to each of the sessions. And we invite you to join all of them if you have time. Of course, if you don't have the time, we're all busy people, there's, there's a calendar or a schedule of sessions. They all start on the hour and please pick those ones that are most resonant to you. 
Uh, and we just uh, um, hope that you enjoyed the day, that you take something from it. I know we, we've already taken something from this morning's presentations, and I'm sure today will be most beneficial for all of us. So thank you for the opportunity to, to close this session, and we look forward to seeing you in the sessions as the day progresses. Thanks, Lynn. Thank you, Mark, and thank you, everyone. Thanks again, Hugh and Tanya and, and Marilyn. Thank you so much. It was just a wonderful way to start our day. Thank you. Look forward to seeing you at nine o'clock. Thanks, everyone. Bye now.